Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tegan Clare, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I will be your moderator, and I'm very glad you've decided to spend part of your day with us. Before we get the seminar started, I want to remind any of our customers joining us today that Unchained Labs is dedicated to supporting our customers through this challenging time. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with your local salesperson, application scientist, service engineer, or contact us directly at our website if there's anything that you need. We're ready to do everything we can to help you. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation today. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom or top of your screen and type in your question. We will get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to introduce Keith Solomon, one of our top-notch application scientists. Today, Keith will be giving you a solid overview of some of the ways our Uncle platform can be used for formulation screening and development. And now I'll hand it over to Keith. Welcome. My name is Keith Solomon. I'm an application scientist at Unchained Labs. My territory includes New England and the upper Midwest. So you happen to live in one of those cold weather states, you might have interacted with me in the past. Today, I'd like to present to you formulary screening using UNCLE tools. Biologics can be quite challenging. Biologics can be oxidized, they can be deaminated, they can be glycated. There is conformational instability to worry about, as well as aggregation a particularly vexing problem. These alterations may directly result in lowered bioavailability, reduced target recognition, increased immunogenicity, and problems in dose delivery. For example, increased viscosity. In particular, aggregation is regard, regarded as a serious concern as aggregates are known to increase clearance, reduce target recognition, increase immunogenicity, and increase viscosity. Consequently, biologics need to be formulated. A good formulation should reduce the opportunity for post-translational modification. For example, adding a surfactant to prevent oxidation. A good formulation should maintain higher order structure, for example, adding a disaccharide to increase delta G. A good formulation should preserve the desired pH, and a good formulation certainly should reduce or prevent aggregation. For example, adding disaccharides or detergents may reduce or prevent aggregation. The UNCLE is a fantastic instrument for examining the biophysical properties of a protein analyte. The UNCLE includes a 266 nanometer laser, a 473 nanometer laser, a 660 nanometer laser, an avalanche photodiode, a CCD, and a Peltier element. And when you put that all together, UNCLE gives you a number of outputs which inform about the biophysical characteristics of your protein analytes. You can measure TM and T onset and the onset of aggregation using the UNCLE. You can measure delta G using a chaotropic salt. You can do sizing and polydispersity using the DLS function of an UNCLE. And you can certainly measure B22, G22, and KD using the UNCLE, measures which give you insight in the propensity of a protein to either aggregate with self or associate with solvent. UNCLE tools provide measures of both structural and colloidal stability. TM, T onset and delta G are measures of structural stability. T ag, the onset of aggregation, and sizing and polydispersity are measures of colloidal stability. 
KD and B22 measure the propensity of molecules to self-associate. All important measures in understanding the biophysical characteristics of a biologic. Using UNCLE's TM, TAG, DLS application, you can get eight data points from a single experiment. Using UNCLE's full spectrum fluorescence, you're able to measure TM and the onset of melting. Using the 266 nanometer laser, you can get small particle SLS. Using the 473 nanometer laser, you can get large particle SLS. Using the DLS of the uncle, you can get polydispersity before and after a thermal ramp, and you can get hydrodynamic diameter before and after a thermal ramp. So by applying a thermal ramp to a protein analyte using the TM, TAG, DLS application, you develop eight critical data points from a single experiment. UNCLE uses intrinsic fluorescence to measure TM and the onset of melting. Essentially, those hydrophobic aromatic residues that are buried in the core of the protein, when the protein melts, they become solvent exposed. Consequently, the emissions profile from those aromatic changes, there's both a diminution of signal and what signal is produced is usually at a longer wavelength. We refer to that as a redshift. So by following the diminution of the signal and the redshift emissions change, we can accurately measure the melting point and the onset of melting. In addition to that, using the 473 nanometer laser, we can look at fluorochromes that may be conjugated to a protein. For instance, a drug that has fluorescence properties might be able to be measured using the 473 nanometer laser. Because proteins melt and aggregate in the same experiment, it is important to recognize both the TM and the onset of aggregation as that protein is undergoing a thermal ramp. In this particular example, we can see that there are two melting points measured for this protein analyte. And between those two melting points, there's the onset of aggregation. So by able being able to measure melting point as well as the onset of aggregation in a single experiment simultaneously, you get detailed, valuable information about the biophysical properties of a protein analyte. Because large and small particles coexist, UNCLE is able to measure the formation of small particles using the 266 nanometer laser and large particles using the 473 nanometer laser get a lot of information about the colloidal stability of a protein analyte using the UNCLE instrument. UNCLE also provides measures of using DLS. Before and after a thermal ramp, we are able to measure both the hydrodynamic diameter of a protein and its polydispersity. And this is important because at the initial temperature of 15 degrees, monoclonal antibody 2 looks like it has a favorable profile with a smaller PDI and a smaller hydrodynamic diameter. But after undergoing a thermal ramp at 95 degrees, you can see that monoclonal antibody has only had a modest increase in hydrodynamic diameter as well as in PDI, where monoclonal antibody 2 forms large colloids and its PDI goes up quite considerably. Consequently, having information 
from DLS at the beginning and the end of the experiment may change the way you look at a protein analyte and may affect the decisions that you make. Here's an example where all of these formulations produce very similar TMs. But by using a chaotropic salt and looking at delta G, we can actually distinguish these formulations. In this example, as you can see here, formulation two produces a much lower delta G than the other formulations, while formulation five produces a somewhat higher delta G. And if you had your druthers, you would probably pick formulation five while certainly eliminating formulation two from further consideration. UNCLE can also provide B22 and KD measures. When you use B22 and KD, you're looking for positive or neutral slopes, which indicate that the protein does not have a propensity to self-associate, while a negative slope indicates a propensity to self-associate, something you want to avoid when you're formulating a protein using biophysical measures to rank formulations. The UNCO instrument provides a number of measures which will help in formulary screening. TM1 is a valuable measure, and you want the highest TM1. The onset of aggregation is another important measure. Here you want the highest value. Some proteins provide a TM2 and TM3. If those measures are available, the higher the better. Once you've refined your formulary screen to perhaps the best five or six candidates, use a chaotropic salt and measure delta G. The higher the delta G, the better. B22 and KD are very useful in formulary screens. Here you want a positive or neutral slope. The relative position of tryptophanes is also a good correlation for long-term stability. We refer to this as lambda max, but due to time constraints, we will not be showing lambda max data in the next part of the talk. Using B22KD in formulary screens. In this example, this monoclonal antibody was either in a histidine buffer or in a histidine buffer with NACL, arginine, or sucrose. As you can see from the top KD graph, both the histidine buffer without an excipient and the histidine buffer with sucrose produce nicely positive slopes. When arginine is added as a, an excipient, you get a negative slope. Consequently, arginine should not be used as an excipient for this particular monoclonal antibody. The B22 data follow along nicely with the KD data. Again, either no excipient or NA, uh, sucrose are preferred while using arginine or NACL may not be your best choice. Using the UNCLE TM TAG DLS application for formulary screens. Here we have four monoclonal antibodies in a 10 millimolar histidine buffer at pH 6.2. Due to time constraints, we will only be looking at the R1, R2, and G1 monoclonal antibodies. In addition to the 10 millimolar histidine buffer, these uh, monoclonal antibodies were formulated with either NACL, sucrose, mannitol, arginine, or glycine. We use the UNCLE's TM, TAG with DLS application, and baricentric mean analysis was chosen for the analysis of TM values.
looking at the results of the R1 monoclonal antibody subjected to a thermal ramp from 15 to 95 degrees. You can first see that the thermograms overlay very nicely in these replicates, and the TM and TM2 drop lines also overlay very nicely in these replicates. Uncle measures TM data with incredible precision, allowing these data to be turned into knowledge. When we look at these data in tabulary form, you can see that the buffer containing sucrose gives you the highest TM1, while the buffer containing arginine provides for the highest TM2. I'd also like to call your attention to the minuscule percent CVs by which Uncle measures TM data, again, allowing these data to really become knowledge. We can also look at small particle formation during the thermal ramp. First, I'll call your attention to other formulations that do not contain arginine and NaCl. They relatively produce very few small particles versus the formulations that contain arginine and NaCl. These other formulations have relatively lower levels of small particle formation and all have similar onsets of aggregation. We can also look at large particle formation using the 473 nanometer laser. In this case, again, the buffers that contain arginine and NaCl produce abundant large particles, while the other formulations only produce nominal large particles. Consistent with the SLS data, we can see that in formula, looking at DLS data, we can see that formulations that do not contain arginine or NaCl show a protein with a pretty good level of colloidal stability. There is some increase in the hydrodynamic diameter as a function of temperature. But in buffers that contain NaCl on this slide and arginine on the next, you could see that there's a much larger increase in hydrodynamic diameter, as well as very poor correlation functions, consistent with large particle. Here we can see the arginine data versus the mannitol and glycine. And again, there is much larger particles formed with arginine and much poorer correlation functions calculated. Using an unweighted reverse ranking system, you can see that sucrose provides for the best formulation for the R1 monoclonal antibody. Let me also say that this ranking system is a device that I created and does not come with your uncle instrument. For the R1 monoclonal antibody, there was a problem of particle formation, and the best formulation was in sucrose. In this slide, we see the results of applying a thermal ramp of 15 to 95 degrees to the R2 monoclonal antibody. Again, let me sh uh, point out how nicely the thermograms overlay in these replicates and how nicely the TM and TM2 drop lines also overlay very nicely. Again, showing the precision by which UNCO measures TM values. Looking at these data in tabulated form, we could see that for the R2 monoclonal antibody, the buffer containing sucrose gives you the best TM1, while the buffer that contains mannitol provides for the best TM2. We can look at both small and large particle formation as a function of temperature. In this particular case, all of the buffers produce 
abundant small and large particles, with sodium chloride producing the lowest onset of aggregation, indicating it to be the worst of these buffers. Looking at these data in tabulated form, you could see that the histidine buffer produces the highest TAG for small particles, while the sucrose buffer is the best TAG for large particle formation. Consistent with the SLS findings, the DLS findings suggest that there is limited thermal colloidal stability in any of these buffers for the R2 monoclonal antibody. There's a great deal of particle size changes leading to correlation functions which could not either be calculated or that are quite poor. Again, using the reverse scoring system, Uncle was unable to di distinguish between the histidine buffer and the sucrose buffer as they all scored the, both scored the best, but certainly these results indicate that buffers containing arginine and NaCl should be removed from further consideration as they did quite poorly. For the R2 monoclonal antibody, there was large particles, large colloid formation. We had the best results in histidine or sucrose-containing buffers. Here you can see the results of applying a thermal ramp from 15 to 95 degrees to the G1 monoclonal antibody. Again, I'd like to point out how nicely the thermograms overlay on one another and how well the TM1 and TM2 drop lines also overlay, indicating how well UNCLE is able to measure TM1 and TM2 values precisely. Looking at these data in tabulated form, you could see that the buffer with mannitol provides the best TM1, while the buffer containing arginine provides for the best TM2. We can look at small particle formation and see that the buffers containing arginine and NaCl produce abundant small particles, while the other formulations produce relatively very few small particles, and all of these formulations have very similar onset of aggregation. We can look at large particle formation and here we see abundant amount of large particles in the buffers containing arginine and NaCl, and nominal large particle formation in the other formulation. Consistent with the SLS data, G1 monoclonal antibody exhibits a great deal of colloidal stability in the histidine and sucrose containing buffers, but the buffer containing NaCl, produces large colloids and poor correlation functions. On this slide, we can see again that the buffers containing mannitol or glycine provide for excellent colloidal stability, almost no change in hydrodynamic diameter as a function of temperature, while the buffer containing arginine produces large colloids and poor correlation functions. Here we can see using the reverse ranking system that the buffer with mannitol provides for the best formulation for this monoclonal antibody. We have a, uh, a question of getting the best TM1 and TM2s for the G1 antibody, and it turns out that mannitol is the best formulation. What have we learned? UNCLE tools can differentiate formulation. UNCLE permits simultaneously, uh, simultaneous evaluation of both conformational and colloidal stability. 
Uncle Tools can identify the best formulation. Uncle Tools can help eliminate poor performance early in the development process and that each antibody truly requires individual formulation for optimal performance. I want to thank you for your time, and I want to ask you to please join me on April 23rd for my next webinar, High Throughput KD B22 Screening Using the Stunner Platform. I also want to announce at this time a brand new adeno-associated virus capsid stability application that will be available on new UNCLE instruments. We are able to measure capsid disruption using the intrinsic fluorescence of the UNCLE at the same time as measuring genome ejection from the capsid using the 473 laser in conjunction with Cyber Gold. In addition, using the 473 laser, we can measure a quasi-melting point, the midpoint of genome ejection, while we're also measuring the aggregation of capsid proteins. Moreover, there's a nice correlation using DLS particle intensity and the AAV concentration. As you can see here in this graphic that AAV concentration and the intensity of the DLS laser signal correlate very, very well. These UNCLE tools will be available on new UNCLE instruments and will be contained within the viral toolbox. If you want to learn more, you can reach out to me or you can email info at unchainlabs.com and please watch out for upcoming sem webinars where this material will be covered in depth. So thank you, Keith, for that great overview of how UNCLE can be used in formulation. Uh, we have some great questions already that have been submitted. Um, you can still ask a question by entering it in the Q&A section by clicking that little button down on the bottom or top of your Zoom navigation bar. A couple of you have already have done that. So Keith, let's tackle the first question. All right. Okay, um, what, sounds good. <laughs> what measure, for example, TM1 versus a TAG, is the most critical to understanding stability? Well, that's a really interesting question, and it's very difficult to answer, um, you know, completely. There's a lot of evidence that TM1 is associated strongly in many studies with a loss of monomer, uh, either through fragmentation or aggregation. And consequently, it's a very important measure of the shelf life, the long-term stability of a biologic. On the other hand, given the importance of aggregation and the role of aggregation in immunogenicity, where you can have a severe adverse uh, effect on a, on a patient, understanding um, the colloidal stability of a biologic is critical. And there are many, there are several mechanisms of aggregation. They don't all involve thermal um, instability. There is aggregation due to uh, disulfide shuffling of a monoclonal antibody. There's aggregation due to salt bridges being formed. So consequently, understanding aggregation in, in sometimes may be more important than understanding the thermodynamic stability of a protein analyte. Um, so I, it's very hard to answer that question. Um, it, it really depends somewhat on, on your sense of these things and what you consider um, as a scientist to be the most important measure. There are some times where I really think that the onset of aggregation is probably the most important measure. And there are other times based on the literature and my understanding of this field that um, TM1 is, is a critical measure. Uh, and it may vary between different um, biologics. So 
um, I'd keep an open mind as to which is the more important measure. Okay, Keith, next question here. Um, so how much sample is used per measurement on the uncle and how long does each measurement take? So the uncle measures uh, intrinsic fluorescence and SLS simultaneously. Um, and it only takes a few seconds to uh, generate that signal on a protein sample. Um, it, we do DLS before and after the thermal ramp. Uh, the DLS measures can take a, a somewhat longer time, um, both because we're doing um, multiple acquisitions as well as uh, needing to tune the laser. So consequently, the DLS measures uh, could take, um, you know, 20, 30 seconds to generate data um, for these samples. Um, in addition to that, the amount of protein that you need is, can be considered quite uh, low. And some of this depends on the, um, the uh, amount of aromatic residues that are present. So, you know, if for some proteins with a great deal of aromatic residues, um, certainly we can do measures at 30 micrograms per ml without a problem. For proteins that have few aromatics, we can probably get up to somewhere over uh, 200 mg per ml. I mean, our general specification is 150 mg per ml, but you know, depending on the extinction coefficient of that protein, uh, there are opportunities for a protein, for instance, like BSA, to get even to higher concentrations and still get really good data. Okay, Keith, the next question here. Um, <clears throat> to what extent um, should antibody purity be considered in screening for better biophysical um, properties for these molecules? Well, the, the purity of that antibody is, is critical for understanding the measures that you're collecting from the uncle. Um, it will only produce a meta signal. So whatever proteins are there, uh, the monoclonal plus impurities, will be collected as a single si uh, signal. And consequently, unless you know what those impurities are and what signals that they produce, you'll be unable to deconvolute the, um, the data completely. Um, so it's best to have a 95% or better purity of your monoclonal antibodies before looking at them at, in the uncle. That being said, we are able, for instance, in AAVs, which have um, three different capsid proteins, to really look at their um, uh, biophysical properties, their uh, melting points, as well as their um, onset of aggregation, uh, pretty completely, even though it's a pretty complex um, situation. I, I've also looked at milk proteins, where there are three different proteins uh, available, and again, we're able to measure TMs and TAGs quite nicely. But for the best result, and certainly doing a formulary screen of a potential biologic, I think that purity is essential. Okay. Keith, a follow-up question to a previous one. So um, what volume is used per, per test or measurement? 8.8. Um, sorry, and then also, um, was any of the data that you, you presented here representing high concentration? So things close to 100 megs per mil. And I guess I'll, I'll add to that. Can Uncle uh, measure those types of, um, th those concentrations of proteins? So the volume is 8.8 .8 microliters. Um, so really you need a very little bit of material to get some really quality data off the Uncle instrument. It really preserves your precious samples, which early on in the development process is, you know, is very critical that you don't waste those samples and UNCLE does not. It gives you a lot of data from a very little bit of sample. Um, though these were not generated at high concentration samples, uh, but UNCLE can easily get to 150 mg per ml, give you some very nice data. Uh, and it, depending on the extinction coefficient, uh, the number of aromatic residues that are available in the protein, uh, it's quite possible to get even higher than 150 mg per ml and still produce quality data. 
it's important, I think, that people understand that when they're doing their reformulations to go from IV to sub-Q delivery, and they need their proteins at higher concentrations, UNCLE is not limited. UNCLE can be used for those IV deliver delivery formulations as well as those sub-Q delivery formulations and provide you with excellent answers. Okay, great. Um, Keith, a, a question on B22 and KD. So um, it says here, I believe you mentioned that a flat slope is best. What are the negative impacts of a positive slope indicating repulsion? I think that would be desired. Um, the, clearly something was not communicated correctly. So a positive slope is best. Uh, a neutral slope is also good. Um, having a, a positive slope means that the protein prefers interacting with solvent as opposed to self. Um, and that would be the most favorable um, analysis that you can have for a biologic is that they really have a propensity not to aggregate and to actually associate with solvent. A neutral slope is okay, it's not bad. What you really want to avoid is those negative slopes. And if you're doing a B22KD analysis, uh, please note that in a KD analysis, you can alter a negative slope by reformulation. So it's a really great way of, of uh, doing a formulary screen because if you're getting a negative slope from a KD and a positive slope from a B22, you, can, you know that you can reformulate and save that molecule and continue to pursue it. If it's, if it's the best, binds the best, has some of the best um, uh, biological activity, um, you can reformulate and actually develop that uh, molecule uh, and get it into, you know, the, into further down the line. Okay, great. Um, Keith, a, a question about the a difference between two of our products. Um, what would be the difference between Uncle and Hunky in terms of the applications they can, they can run and provide? Right, so Uncle does intrinsic fluorescence, it does DLS, it does SLS. Uh, it has a number of applications that it, it can provide you a great deal of answers about the thermodynamic and colloidal stability of a protein. The Hunky only measures delta G and things related to delta G, um, mechanism of aggregation, for instance. Um, so consequently, it really only is useful for uh, if you want to do a lot of delta G measures and you want to use uh, do a 32-point uh, kaotropic salt um, uh, dilution. Um, it's, it, it, it's a fantastic instrument for doing that because it's a liquid handler and then it can uh, measure uh, the delta G and give you really nice transitions without the aggregation events that you have in a thermal ramp. But it's really dedicated for that particular application, looking at delta G with kaotropic salts. The uncle can do that and a whole lot more. Okay, thanks Keith, that's great. Um, just another question um, uh, here. Why, why does SLS data sometimes look, look noisy? Is it due to lower concentrations being used? Sometimes that could be. I mean, it depends on, usually if you have a large amount of particle formation, you don't have a lot of noise. It doesn't look as noisy. When you're looking at uh, low levels of particle formation, it can appear quite noisy. You have to remember the scale that you're looking at. In the examples that we provided here, we were able to see um, aggregates forming at pretty high levels. And consequently, those curves look fairly smooth. And then looking at the maybe the more noisy, lower levels of particle formation curves um, is, is not such a distraction. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, there are other reasons that, you know, they can appear kind of noisy. For instance, you might have aggregates at the beginning of an experiment that dissolve during the heating ramp, and then they, be, they reform as the protein starts denaturing and uh, consequently forms um, colloids. So um, there are several reasons that they can look noisy, but I think sometimes it's really the scale that you're looking at particle formation. 
Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, a question about viscosity and measurements. Um, can you comment on the accuracy of DLS viscosity versus actual measured viscosity with a, a different kind of uh, tool? I don't have direct data um, relating whether you use a viscometer versus a DLS derived viscosity measure. I don't know what the um, error between those two uh, methods of measuring viscosity might be. I know that using DLS and uh, you can easily measure viscosity if you have a standard size um, bead, for instance, a 100 nanometer bead, you can certainly measure viscosity. You just plug that into the Stokes-Einstein equation. Those data should be pretty accurate, but I have no uh, examples that I can recall of a comparison between a viscometer and a DLS measured viscosity. Okay. Um, I have two more questions here for you, Keith. If anyone does have one, um, one more question or a burning question, um, this will be your chance. To, again, the Q&A button down there on the bottom or top of the navigation bar. Just click it, type it in. Um, and if not, we'll answer these last couple questions. Um, Tegan, can I interrupt for a second? Remind people that they can always email me their additional questions. If it comes to them um, yep. later on, please email me. I'm happy to answer them. That's great, Keith. Okay, Keith, here's another good question for you. How do disaccharides and alcohol sugar stabilize monoclonal antibodies? Right, so they're preferentially excluded from those uh, biologics. They create a hydration layer around them and consequently they increase delta G. At least that's the most current um, thinking about how uh, adding a disaccharide or an alcoholic sugar affects the protein stability. Okay, um, and then the, the last question here, um, and uh, I will, there was somebody that just asked a question, can we put up the contact email before we close? Um, yeah, we can do that. So uh, Keith or I will post um, that email contact uh, before we close this out today. So just hang tight with us and we'll put that up there for you. Um, so Keith, last question here. Uh, which domain is the most important in monoclonal antibody stability? Well, I'm going to say that the FAB is probably the most critical. Uh, the sequence can vary the most in the FAB. Um, by sequence optimization, I've seen results where the melting of the FAB has gone from 40 degrees to almost 60 degrees. Um, so it's very susceptible to melting. It's very susceptible to changes in melting by sequence optimization. Um, you can certainly get it to uh, melt cooperatively with the CH2 or even further down uh, the thermal ramp with the CH3 domain. So in many respects, I would think that the FAB is the most critical if you're going to do a sequence optimization. In addition, the FAB domain contains quite a number of hydro, uh, hydrophobic aromatic residues uh, that could um, that could cause aggregation. So I'm, I'm gonna say that the FAB domain is probably the most critical in uh, antibody stability with regard to a thermal ramp. Okay, great, Keith. Um, hey, Keith, thank you for answering all these great questions today. I think that um, you, you've done a great job here and thanks for a great presentation. Um, I also want to thank all of you who joined us today. I think with many of us working from home these days, it's a great time to explore new ideas and solutions to problems. Um, if you would like to have a deeper conversation with Keith or our team about UNCLE and how it can fit into your work, please do get in touch with us. Um, our team would love co to connect with you over this platform, over Zoom meetings. Um, we all have it and we're all happy to set up meetings with anyone that is, is wanting to explore uh, um, our products or solutions to some of the scientific problems you have out there. Um, thank you again for attending our virtual seminar. I hope you'll join us for another one of these um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you everybody.